Today we come to the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 1. This is our sixth study in the book of Hebrews, and we will be going through chapter 9, verse 22. And Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Hebrews 9, verse 1. Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. The first covenant refers to the law, the Ten Commandments, which were given to Moses on Mount Sinai, along with all the other commands and regulations for daily life. The first covenant also includes the sacrifices that were to be brought when a person broke the law of God. And the first covenant also included the priests from the tribe of Levi who ministered to God on behalf of the people. That first covenant had regulations. That is, there was a right way to do things. And if things were not done the right way, it basically didn't count. It didn't work. It was, it was useless going through the motions if you weren't going to do it the right way. And in the case of a priest, if they didn't do it the right way, it could mean death. It says, Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. And so that first covenant had a sanctuary. And that sanctuary was called the tabernacle. And that tabernacle was on earth in the nation of Israel. There was one tabernacle, and that's it. And God had told Moses exactly how he wanted that sanctuary built, and for very good reason. It was an exact duplicate of the sanctuary in heaven. Verse 2. A tabernacle was set up in its first room, were the lampstand, the table, and the consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. The tabernacle actually had three parts to it. It had an outer court. The outer court was where the big altar of burnt offerings was. When you brought an animal or you had a grain offering or something like that, it was burned on that outdoor altar. It, it was enclosed with a fence, as it were, but or walls, but it was still outdoors. So it had the outer court, and then it had a building, and the building had two rooms, an inner room and an outer room. The outer room had an oil lamp, which was an Old Testament picture of Jesus Christ, who said that he was the light of the world. The outer room also had a special table, on Saturdays, twelve fresh loaves of bread were placed on that table by the high priest. The twelve old loaves were removed and were eaten by the priests who were on duty. Those loaves of bread were also an Old Testament picture of Jesus who said that he was the true bread that came down from heaven to give eternal life. And so, <coughs> everything in that old covenant pointed to Jesus Christ either his person or his work the old covenant including the priesthood and the tabernacle and the offerings was never intended to be an end in itself it was pointing to an end the Lord Jesus Christ 3 behind the second curtain was a room called the Most Holy Place. So, like I said, there were two rooms in the tabernacle, the inner and outer room. And there was a thick, heavy curtain which separated the first room in the tabernacle from the inner, most holy room. And it was most holy because God's visible presence was there. And because God is so holy, 
it was off limits to people except for the high priest. The high priest could go in that inner room, but only once a year, and that was only to make an offering for the sins which the people committed that previous year. Look at 3 and 4 together. Behind the second curtain was a room called the Most Holy Place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered Ark of the Covenant. Stop there for a second. He says that there were two pieces of furniture in that inner room, the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant. Actually, the altar of incense remained in the outer room, except for that one day a year, when the high priest would enter the Most Holy Room to offer sacrifice for the sins of the people. On that day, the high priest would bring that small golden altar of incense into the most holy place to burn incense before God. By the way, holy incense was symbolic of prayer. And if you're going to if you're going to go into the presence of God to ask for forgiveness, you better be in an attitude of humble prayer. And that was the point. And so on the Day of Atonement, that one special day, there were two pieces of furniture in the Most Holy Room. There was the Altar of Incense and the Ark of the Covenant. Otherwise, it was just the Ark of the Covenant in there. And speaking of that, the last part of verse 4 says, <coughs> "Excuse me, This Ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's rod that had budded, and the stone tablets of the Covenant. Don't let that word Ark throw you. I never knew what an ark was until I started studying the scripture. Oh, it is. All it was was a box. That's it. And not even that big of a box. I don't remember the exact dimensions. I think it was like three feet by maybe 18 inches, something like that. And it was made out of special wood, but it was gold-plated. And it had a solid gold lid. It represented God's throne. And he was there in the form of a cloud. And God instructed that three things, important items from Israel's history, be placed in that box. There was a jar of manna. And you remember manna. Manna was the miracle food that God sent. God sent manna to earth every day for 40 years, every single morning, so that the Israelites would have something to eat during their journey from Egypt to the Promised Land. And it was miracle food. It had a shelf life of 24 hours. Interestingly, except on the Sabbath day, they could not pick any on Saturday. They were to pick twice as much on Friday. And then, miraculously, it would last 48 hours. Otherwise, it had a shelf life of 24 it rotted after one day. And then, you look at this jar of manna that was in the ark. It had been in there for centuries, proving just how miraculous that food really was. God caused that manna, which normally had a shelf life of 24 hours, to last for centuries. Because it was a living, not a living, but a testimony to how he took care of his people. And he always wanted them to remember that. Look at the last part of verse 4 again. This ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's rod that had budded, and stone tablets from the covenant. The Ten Commandments, written on those stone tablets by the hand of God and given to Moses, were placed in the ark as well. And along with the Ten Commandments and the manna was the staff of Moses' brother Aaron, who was the first high priest. 5. Above the ark were the cherubim of glory. Cherubim were angels or are angels and it says above the ark were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the place of atonement but we cannot discuss these things in detail now God gave instructions on how he wanted that tabernacle built God also gave instructions on how he wanted all the furnishings to be built including the ark and he also commanded that two golden statues of angels be placed on the solid gold lid of the ark. One on one side, one on the other side, both facing each other with their wings overshadowing the throne of God. By the way, nothing wrong with statues. 
Some people are against statues. Nothing wrong with statues. Nothing wrong with, with biblical statues. God commanded in more than one place things like this to be built. The problem comes when people worship them. Anyway, when we, when we get to the book of Revelation and we get a glimpse of heaven, we're going to see that there are real angels surrounding the throne of God in heaven. But like I said, the Old Testament tabernacle was a picture. It was just a scaled-down version of the one in heaven, and the golden angels are part of that picture. There are real angels around the throne of God in heaven. 6. When everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. And so the regular priests, not talking about the high priest, but the regular priests, went into the outer room of the tabernacle every single day. They prepared the oil lamp each morning, and they lit the lamp each evening. They said morning and evening prayers, and once a week they changed that special bread. 7. But only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people, or for the sins that the people had committed in ignorance. On the Day of Atonement, each year, the high priest would offer a sacrifice for his own sin. He would go out by that altar of burnt offering in the outer court. He would offer an animal for his sin. And then he would catch some of the blood after he killed the animal, and he would bring that blood into the holiest room of the tabernacle and he would place that blood on the gold cover of the ark and so that sacrifice on the day of atonement and the blood which was offered to God would result in God covering the high priest's sins for that year and then after he was cleansed or forgiven covered I should say after he was covered he was free to go before God on behalf of the people Look at verse 7 again. But only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself, and for the sins that the people had committed in ignorance. And so, after offering the sacrifice for his own sins, the high priest would go outside and offer a sacrifice for the sins of the people. He would then take some of the blood, like he did for himself, and he would bring it into the most holy room and put it on the gold lid. And so that is how God covered all the sins that the people committed the previous year. And this went on every single year. Verse 8. The Holy Spirit was showing that, showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still standing. The tabernacle by its very existence taught that people were not free to come into the presence of God remember only the priest could enter the tabernacle and only the high priest could enter the most holy place in that tabernacle God was in that tabernacle and it was off limits to people as a result consequently the tabernacle was a constant reminder that people were too sinful to be in the presence of God. It was a reminder that their sin needed to be removed or they would never make it into heaven after they died. Look at verses 8 and 9. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still standing. This is an illustration for the present time indicating that the gifts and the sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. That old tabernacle and the old system of offerings and priests served its purpose. Like I said last time, it kept the heads of the faithful above water. But that was about it. Following the rules of worship and following the regulations for worship in the tabernacle and the regulations for the proper sacrifices was a way that someone proved that they had faith in God that they had a heart for God 
But the fact that all of those animal sacrifices and all the grain offerings and all the prayers that were offered and all the incense that was burned did not remove the need for the tabernacle and make a way for the people to enter into the presence of God without having to bring more offerings proved that there was something lacking in that system. Otherwise it would have just ceased to be. The offerings was made, were made, the incense was burned, fine, you're reconciled to God. But it didn't work that way. It, it, these things had to be repeated over and over again, proving that there was something lacking in that system. It wasn't quite doing the job. It had its place, but it wasn't doing the job. Look at night again. This is an illustration for the present time indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. The Old Testament sacrifices were nice. The old system was wonderful. It was great. However, none of those sacrifices cleared the offerer's conscience of the guilt of sin. The people knew that those offerings were not enough. If they had been enough, then the people never would have had to offer another sacrifice. But they did, year after year. 10. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations, applying until the time of the new order. And so the old covenant had many regulations. There were laws about food and laws about drink and laws about special types of ceremonial washings that you went through. And all those regulations and all those ceremonies dealt with the outside of a person. They did not cleanse their soul of sin. Like everything else in the Old Covenant, the rituals pointed to Jesus in one way or another. And by doing them, the people showed that they had an obedient heart, a heart of faith. But none of those none of those things, none of the regulations, none of the sacrifices, none of the rituals, none of any of those things changed anyone's permanent standing with God. Making the proper sacrifices and keeping the regulations was just a temporary fix to keep people from going to hell until Jesus came and actually paid for their sins on the cross. And so the old order, which pointed to Jesus, lasted until the new order, Jesus and the cross, arrived. And you don't need something that points to something when you already got the something. 11. When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, stop there for a second. The good things that Jesus Christ is the high priest of refers to all the things that Jesus purchased for us on the cross. We could spend six months, we could spend six years studying all those things. But I will sum them up by saying this. He got rid of our sins and reconciled us to God. That's it in a nutshell. He reconciles us to God through the offering of himself on the cross. And that is something that all of the animal sacrifices which were offered for centuries, all those animal sacrifices put together could not even come close to doing getting rid of our sins and reconciling us to God once and for all. Look at 11 again. When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is to say, not a part of this creation. The Old Testament high priest would enter the tabernacle on earth and offer the sacrificial blood for the sins of the people. We already went through that. Well, Jesus died as the perfect offering for the sins of people. However, unlike the priest in the Old Testament who took that blood and put it on the Ark of the Covenant on the Day of Atonement, unlike those priests, Jesus did not come down from the cross, take a cup of his blood, walk through the streets of Jerusalem from Mount Calvary, go to the temple, go inside the Most Holy Room, and pour the blood on that golden ark. Jesus did not do that. He did something else with his blood. Look at 11 and 12 together. When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is to say, not a part of this creation. 
he did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. I'm telling you, those things that the Old Testament priests did on the Day of Atonement pictured what Jesus would do. After dying on the cross as a sacrifice for our sins, Jesus took some of his blood and presented it to God the Father in the holy sanctuary of heaven. Not on earth, but the real one in heaven. And notice what verse 12 says, He obtained eternal redemption when he offered his death to God on our behalf. His blood did not just cover sins, like all of those bulls and all those lambs and all that other kind of stuff in the Old Testament. His blood paid for our sins permanently. 13. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. The things mentioned in here in verse 13 were all used in Old Testament rituals. They were used to give a person a temporary spiritual cleansing. None of those rituals removed sins or made a person right with God permanently. Going through them was an act of obedience which allowed a person to live and function in the Jewish religion. They kept the person from being cut off from God but they did not take away their sin or make them right with God permanently. Look at 13 and 14 together. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God cleanse our consciences from dead works so that we may serve the living God? It says that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses our consciences from dead works. Dead works are works that lead to death. And the works that lead to death are sin. Sin leads to death. Ultimately, to eternal death in hell. If sin is not removed, that is where people go. The death of Jesus Christ completely paid for all the sins of all people. He redeemed the world. Now whether people take advantage of that, that's a different story. But he redeemed the world. And those who receive his salvation and submit to his lordship have their souls completely cleansed of all their sins. Their sins are gone. They are indwelt by the Spirit of God. And they are given the power to live for God. Christians can pray to God and know that He hears. We can serve God and know that He helps because we are connected to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. 15. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that He has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. That's a mouthful. Boy, if Paul didn't write this, then it's somebody who's imitating him. Someone says, you know, <clears throat> I don't, I just don't know why anybody messed around with that old covenant. Why, why would you even go through all the rituals? Why would you bring the sacrifices? Why would you do all that if it didn't connect you to God? But wasn't it a waste of time? No. It was not a waste of time to live under the old covenant and to abide by the Old Testament system. Not at all. Because of what this verse says. Now watch this. All those sins that all of those Old Testament offerings covered were eventually washed away by Jesus. By adhering to the Old Testament system, you were at least getting into the salvation boat. You were getting into the boat. You were not being pulled ashore you were not rescued but you were at least in the boat and you were kept afloat until Jesus died on the cross 
and pulled you to heaven's shore. Because when Jesus died, he paid for all the sins that the people who lived by the Old Testament system committed. That was the important by li- the importance of living by the Old Testament system. You lived by the Old Testament system. You were faithful to do that. You got in the salvation boat. When Jesus died, he paid for your sins. So think of it this way. The faithful Old Testament people were saved by the Savior who was to come. The faithful New Testament people, us, are saved by the Savior who has come. But one thing is for sure. No one who is in heaven, or will be in heaven, will get there in any way other than through Jesus Christ. 16. In the case of the will. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it. Because a will is in force only when somebody has died, it never takes effect while the one who made it is living. <clears throat> and that's how a will works. Before we die, we can choose who will own our things after we die. We make a will, which explains who gets what. But before that person can take our things, there must be proof that we are dead. A will is an agreement, which isn't activated until there is a death. Why does God bring this up? Because it illustrates something. Look at 17 and 18. Because a will is in force only when someone has died, it never takes effect while the one who made it is living. This is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. Just like it takes a death to activate the legal agreement, which is a will, so also it took a death to activate the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, which was an agreement between God and his people. Look at 19 and 20. When Moses had proclaimed every commandment of the law to all the people, He took the blood of calves, together with water, scarlet wool, and branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll in all the people. He said, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. Moses got the law from God on Mount Sinai, came down to the foot of the hill, and that's where all the people were. And Moses read the entire old covenant, including the Ten Commandments which he received on Mount Sinai from God. He read the entire thing to the people. He read the promises that would accompany obedience. He read the punishment that would result from disobedience. And the people of their own free will agreed to enter into that covenant with God. And some animals were sacrificed to seal the deal. To officially get that old covenant started. 21. In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. Now, we saw in verse 20, or in, uh, in verse 19 that some of that animal blood that was sacrificed to seal the old covenant some of it was placed on God's law some of it was sprinkled on the people some of it was even sprinkled on the things that the priests would use in worship in the tabernacle everything was sprinkled with blood the blood which represented the animals which were sacrificed to connect God and the people at least temporarily. Some of that blood was placed on everyone and everything involved in this covenant. The blood made everything that touched it a part of this holy agreement between God and man. You see, I don't get it. Why is blood so important? Because of verse 22. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. That's why it's so important. God says in his word that the wages of sin is death. In other words, the consequence of sin is death. Sin is why people die. Sinners die physically, and unless their sins are removed before they die, they will burn in hell forever, which is called eternal death. And here's the deal. This is what it boils down to. Either we spend eternity paying for our sins in hell, eternal death, or we accept Jesus' payment for our sins on the cross. Either we die physically and eternity, eternally I should say, for our sins, or we accept Jesus' death on our behalf. But one way or another, 